Good morning, USA, and welcome to another episode of the Bernie or Bust Show. Unshaved, unbathed, unedited, and unscripted. Good coffee? Have a slurp yourself. Pull up a chair. Bernie or Bust rides again. I've been waiting for this moment. Nico House interviewed Victor Tiffany, the original gangster of Bernie or Bust, and we're going to talk about that. And first, though, we're going to talk about this poll, Revolt Against Plutocracy. This is um, Victor Victor's page, and he put in this uh, on a whim. He just threw this together and then stopped paying attention to it. I noticed it right away. If Bernie Sanders does not win the nomination, you will vote blue, not vote blue. I thought, oh, wow, this could get traction. So I started sharing it. And... Within a couple of hours, it had over a thousand votes. And so this is like a lightning rod. This is dividing the seas, parting the seas. Moses, uh, Zarathustra, whatever you want. This is a big deal. And these these polls, if we can keep putting these polls in front of people, it's going to start the conversations, heated conversations. And I think eventually the media are going to pay attention. I don't think that's why Nico... So I mean, Nico is originally on the committee of revolt against plutocracy. So he he's been a friend. I guess that's a, a disclosure. But um, what we've got here is this poll that's gone not viral exactly, but it already has two point three thousand votes, and it has comments and it has shares, one hundred and seven shares, which could cause it to go viral. This poll is going to end today or tomorrow, I can't remember when, when he started it. But um, it says 58% will not vote blue. If you have 58% of Bernie supporters who agree in advance not to vote blue, that's a big, big problem for Neera Tandon, for John Cowan, for David Brock, for the Clinton machine, which is still active, don't believe me, Warren and Clinton talk behind the scenes as the 2020 race intensifies. Neither camp wants to talk about it. I imagine not. But this came out yesterday. Today, by the way, is Bernie Sanders' birthday. Happy birthday, Bernie. So happy that you're in the world. Elizabeth Warren's team doesn't want to talk about Hillary Clinton, but that doesn't mean they aren't talking to to each other. They have each other on speed dial, apparently. And a person who is close to Clinton said the contact has been substantial enough to merit attention, describing a conversation between the two as seemingly recent because it was front of mind for her. As she seeks to blend her movement-based progressive campaign with a Democratic establishment long wary of her populist brand of politics, Warren has been maintaining and creating relationships with a wide array of Democratic establishment figures. And if the race for nomination goes long, as many Democrats now predict, of course they do because they they stuffed the race full of, of Democratic hopefuls, most of whom were Clinton delegates and superdelegates. Clinton could become a pivotal could become pivotal as an ally, an adversary, or a neutral observator, observer, not just pivotal. Uh, she she could put her both thumbs on the scale and and push down and on either side. So uh, that the establishment is still going, and if we want to get their attention, then we uh, we should start spreading surveys like this around. Uh, my my goal is to to do one of these at least every week and start pushing them in front of everybody in the Bernie groups, and I think they'll they'll make their way into the to the other uh, Democrat groups, and I think what we're going to figure out is that this is a battle that's already raging and that's already won. I've said that before. Bernie or bust has already won, but um, everyone is in denial, and we'll know that we have their attention when the Washington Post, when CNN, when MSNBC, when New York Times, 
start to come out and criticize Bernie or Bust. Right now they're ignoring us, but when they start to criticize us, then we'll know that we have hit a nerve. And then we'll know that it's too late for them. And that's when, um, that's when the shit will hit the fan. And I, I don't even know what's going to happen then. But I, I predict that they'll get completely behind Elizabeth Warren um, no matter what happens, and we'll try to put her in front of Bernie. And if that doesn't work, and if um, if this kind of percentage keeps going into February of next year, then they, they'll they shift their money behind Donald Trump. It'll be quiet, it'll be sneaky, but, but the machinery that supports David Brock and, and John Cowan and Neera Tandon, the neoliberal... Uh, fascist group, they're they're going to go right behind Trump. They're going to help pay for his television ads, and and they don't care because Bernie, as they say, is an existential threat to the Democratic Party. Now let's let's go to a, an interview, the interview I promised, and and we'll we'll see many many good reasons to vote for Bernie in the primaries and not wait until they anoint someone else who's conducive to Wall Street. So um, so now that we're kind of on the back end, and it's crazy, it seems like it was just yesterday that we were at that rally in Philadelphia. Um, back, I was still living in New York back then. But, you know, it's 2019 now. How do you feel looking back? Do you feel like Bernie or Bus was the right decision? There's a lot of arguments that people, oh, what a Supreme Court. Oh, well, Hillary would have been better. Oh, well, you know, don't look at how bad Donald Trump is. Look at Do you feel that you made the right decision? Oh, absolutely. Hillary, for the same two reasons I pointed out in uh, my speech at the Bernie and Bush rally, Hillary, Hillary was a reckless warmonger. I mean, she made a mistake on her vote in Iraq. And then she turns around and repeats the same mistake for Libya. Same mistake. What are you doing? She didn't learn anything. She spearheaded the, the mm -hmm. mistake in Libya. So, Damn mistake. <laughs> so she's a warmonger. She doesn't learn from her mistakes. And then she wants the snow fly zone over uh, Syria, which the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Ta Staff testified to a Senate committee means going to war with Syria and Russia. Going to war yeah. with Russia. That's what we wanted from our next president, or, you know, 2015. Trump. That's true. For all his faults, has not gone to war yet with anyone. And he, he could have started World War III. Iran, and he chose to back off. Yep. And, and as you and I already said, he may wag the dog before uh, November of 2020. But at this point, he's not. What he means by wagging the dog is that he will go into war because, um, well, if the economy tanks, he de he's very likely to do that, to go to war with Iran or or Syria, or both, just just because it would help his election numbers. It would help him get reelected, because war and the economy are the two uh, ways an incumbent president can can tip the scales towards himself or herself. <laughs> Hopefully, someday herself. The warmonger I thought he was, and very important point, which is also made at this rally. It has to do with Trans-Pacific Partnership. So few people understand the threat posed by the trans Pay attention, people, because this is a very clear and brief explanation. So don't go get extra coffee right now. Pay attention right now to what the Trans-Pacific Partnership means. Very, As he said, very few people understand this, but this is the very most important reason because it relates to the to the environment and every other every other economic justice, etc. If you don't understand the Trans-Pacific Partnership, then you're going to keep being susceptible to the vote blue people. Pay attention. Trans-Pacific Partnership. Sure, there were a lot of protests against it. People understood people were against it, but they didn't understand the depth how bad of, it was, yeah. of how bad it was, what a threat this was. It would have fundamentally transformed, and that's Obama's language, although he wasn't clear what he was talking about, it would have fundamentally transformed the United States from theoretically a democratic self, a system of democratic self-government where our representatives regulate corporations to a system of corporate 
self-government, where during yeah. the secret negotiations, they wrote the, the, their own regulations, and then it gets imposed through these trade agreements. And the regulations are already written. The transnational corporations have already written this bill. It's all ready to go. We just need a president who's willing, like Clinton would have been, or like Elizabeth Warren would be, to just to put it into to place. The, the, we were very close to disaster here with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And enforced by these uh, tribunals, these investor state dispute settlement tribunals, private corporate tribunals that override the laws passed by our representatives in government. It was, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's a, it would, it's an unprecedented. Court it would have turned us from an unofficial oligarchy to an an uh, of to super official oligarchy, and I would say, and I've I've like right. read where people have made this, and I was kind of like, man, that might be a little bit extreme, but the more you look in the trans, it would have literally been the quote unquote new world order that everybody was terrified of. That's what that, what that's what, what, that's what they were called. trying to achieve. That's what Joe. Oh, Biden really? Called. Yes, he <laughs> called. He said this will be a new world order. Yeah, so that's um in glowing like, terms, <laughs> and yeah, right. I know the same way Henry Kissinger said, that. and it's, I will give Trump credit though. He never invited Henry Kissinger back to his office after he said that. And he, Henry Kissinger made that New World Order comment. He was like, okay, this guy has to go. All right, and the, and to Trump's credit. Trump, they were trying to escalate military tensions in Venezuela. Trump said, nah, he, 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 they're too much for me. I don't want to do all that with Iran. Same thing. Um, I do have a problem with how he's handling Syria. I obviously have a problem with how he's handling Israel. Israel. Um, I still have a problem with how he's handling Venezuela, but at least they're not at war right now. That's all very important because if you're a conservative watching the Bernie or Bus show, or if you lean conservative, or if you, like me, have ever been conservative, then then this makes a lot of, mis a lot of sense. I've said before that Bernie, make no mistake, is a constitutionalist. And those tend to be more on the right side of the political aisle. Uh, people will just disagree because they don't have the information, but but it's true. But anyway, b back to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But with, with Hillary... In reality, you know, he doesn't... Yeah, he's, he's not living it. Honest. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're about to change topics, but the... But one thing you can say about Trump, unless unless he has to pull the trigger because he thinks he won't get reelected, he didn't he didn't do the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So we dodged a bullet there. Now they're going to go on and talk about the Supreme Court, and that's a big, big deal. And what you'll what you'll hear them say, I'll let them tell you. <laughs> but the thing is, every day we do live with a cut question of whether or not Trump might go to war, whether or not Trump might tweet something in the middle of the night that could piss somebody <laughs> off. I don't have to wonder that with Hillary, which is a conversation, once again, that we've had often. I know for a fact yeah. we would be at war right now with Iran if Hillary was in office. She made it very clear. We know for a fact that there is a good potential that we would have been at war with North Korea also yeah. if Hillary was in office. And she made that Certainly very clear more, in the WikiLeaks. More deeply involved in Syria, no question about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there, you know, Bashar al-Assad might be completely, like, taken out at this point. There, it could be, Syria would be leveled. It's already bad, but it would be almost leveled if, um, if Hillary was in office. And so... Uh, when people used to ask me, I remember we had also had the conversation about Bernie or Bus being a movement of privilege. And I just was like, it's crazy to me that the people, the limousine liberals. Pay attention to this part. Nico has had trouble being profiled as a black man. And he has talked about this on other shows. He he just bre he just kind of alludes to it. If you didn't know the background, you wouldn't understand what he's about to say want to protect their feelings. Oh, man, well, Donald Trump the makes me feel bad. It's dawned on me that the privilege is coming from the blue no matter who types. Right. They're the privileged yeah, ones. Yeah. That the people why why does it not matter who it is? This was so confusing to me. <laughs> the, 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 the Bernie or Busters were actually more desperate. They were, they were yeah. privileged. They were desperate. We demand Bernie because they're in desperate shapes. They want that $15 an hour. Right. They need Medicare for all. This isn't something that they... And that's especially true in swing states. If you look at the um, at the data in swing states, the coal miners and other people in swing states, they desperately need a populist candidate. And Trump fooled them, but they what they really need is somebody who won't fool them, who really will help them in out of their desperate straits. They, you know, that they they did out of out of any sort of privilege. They were 
they were hurting. These are people who are mm -hmm. not privileged, just the opposite mm -hmm. of, the, of the accusation there. Yep. And I used to I used to get so infuriated because as someone who's been a victim of the criminal justice system that was largely perpetuated by the Clintons and celebrated by the Clintons, that same criminal justice system that the Clintons got rich off of, people want to look me in my face and say, well, burning your buses, you're, you're displaying your privilege. What? <laughs> Come on. Really? I'm sorry that I didn't want her to damn near bolster the 94 crime bill that she got in office because she literally still had the stocks. Like she was supposed to sell them, she did it. Like she was supposed to get rid of the Clinton Foundation when she got uh, picked sec as secretary. There's some homework you can do to see how Hillary Clinton directly benefits financially through stock, through investments from the police industrial complex. This is really ugly stuff that he's talking about and it'd be worth looking into if you have time. State, and she didn't do that either. Like we, we could literally see the trajectory in which she was heading as far as the Supreme Court is concerned. I feel like that's, a, I feel like people really do not understand how the political process works. And she would, she, TPP was the main reason that she was supposed to be in office, right? That's why a lot of the oligarchs around the world were fighting for her and donating. The news don't, they don't want you to know this. Pay attention. That is the main reason that, that the corporate the or oligarchy was behind Hillary right there because they thought TPP would be a done deal. The Clinton Foundation, because they all were going to benefit from TPP. And guess what she would have negotiated to get, because re remember, Democrats and Republicans opposed TPP. It, it, was, a, it was a bipartisan disagreement there. She and would have the center and agreement. And the yeah. margins disagreed, agreed with each other, but disagreed with TPP. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And she would have the, in the Republicans to get a Supreme Court seat would have given her a TPP. Yep. And she would have gladly given it to them. And even if she wasn't going, even if she wasn't negotiating that process, who does it say she would put in a liberal judge? What evidence oh, yes. do we have? <laughs> yeah. Like what evidence do we have? That, that this is huge because Obama put in not a liberal judge, Gorsuch, Gorsuch. To say that she would do Obama's that. Obama's nominee was not a liberal. He's the one who gave us super PACs and, uh, uh, you know, voted to. Basically, he gave us super PACs. Yes, yeah. he worsened the process. He wor he he worsened the Democratic yes. process. And yes. Obama was considered way more liberal than Hillary Clinton. Whenever he ran, he people forget how progressive of a campaign Obama ran. It's you scary, know, actually. Else, people. Uh, forget about Obama and it, and it applies to the TPP. He was very good. He, he wasn't good at getting much passed most of the time because of the Republican party opposition, but in the lame duck sessions, the guy was just brilliant at compromising. I'll give you this. You give you that. Yeah, you know, he, he was got a lot done. Not people disagreed with some of it because he was compromising. He was giving Republicans things they wanted in order to get things he wanted, like the start agreement. In, in exchange for permanent permanent tax cuts. People were really upset about that, but I thought it was brilliant because the START agreement, the, the strategic arms reduction agreement was, was way more important than a stupid tax cut. And Jeff Weaver made a point in his book on the 2016 election that Obama was going to push TPP in the lame duck session. We, if Hillary Clinton yeah. had won that contest, we would be under complete corporate control now. Yes, through the TPP. And so, what people don't also I don't they also don't know that John play. Podesta, when John Podesta became his chief of staff, that's when it went really downhill. And who was going to be Hillary Clinton's chief of staff? Yeah, right. Podesta. I don't want to downplay how horrible Trump is. He, 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 you know, the choice that the two part major parties gave us in 2016 was a gunshot to the chest or an arrow in the back. So we got the arrow in the back, and <laughs> and, and we're bleeding, we're suffering, we're you know this is a cakewalk under Donald Trump. He is a neo-fascist. So we're in a, but, but the problem is people can't wrap their heads around, you know, like people like Neera Tannen who think Hillary Clinton was the greatest thing on earth. They can't wrap their heads around the fact that these were two really horrible choices. And Susan Sarandon, just to pick somebody who never used the phrase burn your bust, made the right choice. She voted for somebody who represented Democratic order and opposite uh, fair trade agreements and and peace rather than war in the Middle East. So, you know, part of the problem. I like to use the phrase uh, 
two-party mental prison. Big part of the problem people have is they're locked inside this prison and the, and all their framing is within that prison. They can't step outside of that prison and say, gee, maybe I should vote third party this time. And, yeah. and that's something, you know, I think the younger people, the, the so-called Bernie or Buffs generation that I alluded to, I think they're out of it. And, and part of the, what we, what the feedback we are getting, let me just start over with, with the Bernie or Buffs generation, that, as, as they're called. It was a essay contest winner that was published in the New York Times back in June. I can't remember her name, but she talked to, she's a 17 year old. She's going to be a first time uh, voter next year. And she says, I'm part of the Bernie or bus generation. My eyes kind of popped out of my head when I, when I saw that. And I, and I used it a few times, but I just didn't know if it was her making that claim or if there was some actual validity to it. So our last blast to all the Bernie or Busters who are still subscribed to our newsletter, I, I asked, have any of you talked to young people and, and are no, and are aware of the fact that young people, post-millennial young people, are Bernie or Bust, however they define it, because she said, I'm going to stay home. And that's not how we define or bust. And someone in San Francisco, he's out working for Bernie every Sunday downtown at some table. He talks to a lot of young people. And he says, yes, it's not just the first time voters, it's college kids also. They saw what the DNC did to Bernie last time, and they're still pissed off about it. And they are very much Bernie, some version of Bernie or bus. Maybe they won't vote for third party, maybe they'll stay home. But they're part of the problem that someone like Elizabeth Warren or Joe Biden or any of the rest of these establishment Democrats are going to have this time. They're yeah. Not- yeah, I'm going to leave it there. So, so there are a lot of other groups, the poor, the poorly educated um, intellectuals who, who know that, that, who know more about TPP and SCOTUS and other big issues. What we, what we, just to wrap it up, what we, what we see here is that uh, even Elizabeth Warren, or maybe even especially Elizabeth Warren, because she's so stealthy, is not the antidote to Trump. And we and nobody's saying we need Trump. What we're saying is that we have absolutely terrible choices unless it's Bernie or as as Nico would definitely agree with or Tulsi. And so we need to we need to keep reminding people of this kind of a poll here. If we've got these these kinds of numbers in Bernie groups, then we and in we don't know yet about Democrat groups, but we've got a few months to figure it out. If we get anything like this kind of a ratio, they're, they're not going to get anybody but Bernie or maybe Tulsi if, if Bernie has um, uh, any kind of a trouble, any kind of a medical issue or any other reason for him to drop out, family reasons, who knows? Who knows who's leaning on him? But that I didn't bring my tinfoil hat, so I'll leave it there. Have some more coffee. Have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow.